very happy to welcome you to today's gender economics seminar. Today we have with us Nancy Fulbre, who's going to present her forthcoming book called The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems. Nancy is Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is certainly a leader in this field and has written extensively on gender issues in economic systems. Uh, one of the main themes in her work has been to understand the role of care work in economic systems more broadly and how it shapes economic and social gender inequalities in various ways. Um, Nancy has also been very active in the International Association for Feminist Economics and she's been the president of that organization. And if you don't know this IAFI, this organization, uh, if you don't know it, um, you should we recommend to go to the website, look at the events. For example, there's a great uh, annual conference. So the format of today's talk is going to be 40 minutes for the presentation and then 20 minutes for questions. And if you have questions, uh, you can uh, enter them in the Q&A function. So if you take your mouse cursor and go to the bottom of the screen, you can see the little Q&A. Um, function there. If you press that, you can type in your question. And if there are clarifying questions, Ulle might interrupt Nancy during the talk to ask those. And other questions uh, are going to become a speaker list uh, for the Q&A at the end. And we are going to call on you to ask your question in person. Uh, we would also encourage you to use the chat function for any broader discussion with each, with each other or about the paper more broadly and topic. So with that, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Nancy. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the, um, what I know will be a very interdisciplinary and international discussion. Uh, let me just share my PowerPoint screen. So the topic of my book and my presentation is the rise and decline of patriarchal systems an intersectional political economy. And I take as my introductory image uh, Occupy Wall Street poster from 2011. Um, there's a, a dancer, a ballerina on top of the bull of Wall Street. It's not quite clear how long she's going to stay there, but for now, she seems to be on top of things. I think it's interesting that um, Occupy Wall Street took this very gendered image uh, as its kind of uh, watchword, as its rallying cry. And I think it says something about the way in which um, people's understanding of changes in gender roles uh, is really informing their changes, their understanding of changes that are happening in other uh, hierarchical um, relationships and contested uh, exchanges. So I know my title kind of evokes the famous decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but I want to really emphasize from the outset that I didn't say fall of a patriarchal system. I said rise and decline. And that decline could easily be reversed for reasons that I think we're all familiar with. And I think that uncertainty makes it all the more important to understand um, what's happening. So, in a way, the subtitle of my book is the most important part, that I'm trying to develop an intersectional political economy. And what I mean by that is that people have multiple identities, but also multiple economic interests. And they negotiate these in some uh, pretty complicated ways that I think we're just beginning to understand. So since we're on the eve of the US presidential election, I thought I would use a little um, analysis of the polls to give an uh, example of what I mean by uh, the complexity of intersectionality. Uh, what our polls are showing now is the biggest gender gap in U.S. history ever. Only 36% of likely voters who are women support Trump, compared to almost half of men. There's an even bigger and, and, and very persistent racial ethnic gap, especially true for whites, a majority of whom support Trump versus Blacks, only 8% supporting, and Hispanics, only 29% supporting. Uh, there's an inverse relationship of support for Trump. Um, only 28% of those with graduate degrees support him, 
49% of those with high school degree or less. And if you look at the educational continuum between those two, it just it's just shows a steady, uh, a steady correlation, negative uh, correlation. On the other hand, income is positively related to support for Trump. So taking, you know, setting aside all the other differences and looking at, at income, low income families, those with income under 50,000, uh, uh, only 35% are supporting Trump. So um, the challenge is to understand the gender gap in the context of all these other gaps and to try to analyze them in, in consistent, uh, consistent ways. A lot of you may be familiar or not with intersectionality as a kind of sociological theory about the way people think about themselves or the way other people um, relate to them uh, by virtue of signals about their identity. But I think that uh, intersectionality really needs a big dose of political economy and that's what I'm trying to provide. So I, I think we need to look beyond agents who are um, thinking about themselves and their, and their particular actions to structure the, the context in which agents are making decisions. I think we also need to look beyond concepts like inequality or the extraction of surplus value and arrive at a, a more general uh, approach to unfair differences in bargaining power that lead to both inequality and exploitation. And finally, I think that means that we need to look to a better theory of coalition and alliance that's got to be based on some pretty broad principles of economic justice. So here's a visual image of of, of what I think of as an intersectional approach. Instead of one pyramid based on income or, or race or gender, a lot of overlapping uh, pyramids, uh, almost uh, kind of fractal complex uh, structure. So I, I'm actually defining structure pretty loosely as, as sets of institutions that operate in concert to put uh, some, some particular groups at a disadvantage in collective and individual bargaining. So let me take a patriarchal structure of collective power as a kind of example of that. Um, so political, ideological, and economic institutions uh, that I would call patriarchal become a, a kind of collective power structure. And it's not just about inequalities based on gender, age and sexuality also come into play. So that's, uh, again, kind of this fractal uh, complexity that's really, really crucial. And um, some examples, uh, just to bring the point home, uh, political institutions, laws and public policies, uh, ideological institutions that are shaping perceptions, norms and preferences, um, economic institutions, differences in access to resources, financial capital, human capital, social capital, also control over the products of one's labor are really, really important to economic institutions. And that will play a big part in my analysis. So we know that patriarchal law has left a particularly uh, clear track record. It's, it's not difficult to trace its evolution. And in many respects, patriarchal law is in, in abeyance uh, throughout uh, much of the, the, the globe. Joran Thurborn's work it does a magisterial job of documenting the decline of, 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 of really specific uh, legal incarnations of patriarchal power. But there are other parts of the structure of collective power that remain pretty, um, pretty strong. And uh, one example is a question I, I often invoke from the general social survey. Uh, do you agree, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree that it is much better for everyone involved if the man is the achiever outside the home and the woman takes care of home and family? And you know, over 35% of respondents in the US agree with that statement. Uh, and in fact, I think it probably does overlap pretty strongly with, with support for, for Donald Trump. Um, and my understanding is that differences, answers to that question in Europe are, are, are similar, um, but not so, perhaps not as extreme as they're in, in the US. So in terms of economic factors in the US now, and I think this is also true in much of Europe, much of, most of the difference in men's and women's earnings derives from two factors, that women devote more time and energy to unpaid care, and that women are overrepresented in paid care jobs in health, education, and social services. So that uh, specialization itself reduces women's access to economic resources. 
uh, investments in other people come at the expense of investments in your yourself or your own earnings trajectory. Care for other people involves emotional attachments, um, sometimes referred to in rock music as being prisoners of love. Um, and also, it's very difficult to capture the returns from long-term investments that primarily benefit other people and pay off at some point in the future. So um, I think there's some, some very specific aspects of care work uh, that make specialization in it an economic liability uh, almost independently of gender, although women's specialization in it obviously uh, kind of uh, exacerbates uh, the, the consequences. So, so let's think a little bit about uh, conceptualizing collective power in a, uh, a way that reaches beyond gender. I think that collective power structures are, are created, They're, the institutions that comprise them are created by individual and collective action. And what they do is they define the space in which individual and collective agents operate. So there's still plenty of room for individual um, idiosyncrasy, individual choice, uh, individual action, but um, the constraints that are imposed on those actions are really defined by uh, uh, specific sets of institutions that shape bargaining power. And in the book and elsewhere, I've tried to take this in a more formal direction, looking at uh, fallback positions in a, a Nash bargaining model. I'm not going to go into that here, but uh, uh, a lot of my analysis is really informed by thinking about non-cooperative and cooperative games um, that are unfolding kind of simultaneously. So I would categorize these, um, I would categorize these uh, structures of collective power by their group effects. Who benefits? Do men benefit more than women? Do old people benefit more than young people? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a pretty simple and approximate question. Um, uh, but I think it's, it sort of gets at the economic uh, content of what I mean by a structure of collective power. So I'm seeing uh, distinct but largely parallel hierarchies connected by individuals who intersect and I, uh, with a lot of synergies, uh, influence across all these, all these structures. So what happens is that these intersectional differences create strategic dilemmas uh, for people and for groups because people may experience advantage in one group, but but disadvantage in another. Uh, in other words, they might be in a contradictory location. And it's often hard for them to perceive the costs and benefits. It depends partly on the simultaneous decisions of other people. So that's why group identity and theoretical narratives and ethical commitments um, are so important to understanding what, what shakes out. You know, economists like to talk about growth, increasing the slice, increasing the size of the pie that everybody gets. But um, from a bargaining perspective, people, I think, are considering the size of the pie, but they're also considering the share of the pie, how big their slice is. And often they might be motivated by a desire to get a bigger slice of a smaller pie than a small slice of a bigger pie. And I think that explains why distributional co conflict is always complicating the process of economic growth and development. Trying to situate this analysis and in, in kind of thinking of, about evolutionary game theory and multi-level selection, collective power structures can reduce free rider problems, which increases the size of the pie. I think cooperation has a lot of really clear benefits, but collective power structures really create top rider problems. That is the people who are imposing the discipline are often in a position to extract rents or power from that. And I see democratic institutions as an effort to address both these problems an uh, effort that's often only very partially successful. So now I want to apply this very quickly to thinking about how patriarchal power structures have emerged and evolved. This is kind of why I think the case study of patriarchal systems uh, is so important. Um, in early human history, there's a lot of evidence that population growth really contributed to group success. Military strength, more workers, more output, um, ability to expand at the expense of other groups. And patriarchal power structures, especially early, um, uh, 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 really early patriarchal power structures seem really to have very pro-natalist uh, consequences and really promoted population growth in a variety of ways. Seizing women from vanquished groups, forcing women to specialize in 
uh, child rearing makes the care for dependents cheaper, uh, for, especially for men, uh, reduces the op uh, potential for an opportunity cost of devoting time to care work. But it also has some economic incentives for men to support families because of the benefits that they derive both individually and as a member of a, a, a many different groups. So uh, I think uh, there's a lot of evidence that economic development reduces uh, some of the gains uh, to patriarchal power. Uh, the quality of human capabilities becomes more important than uh, the quantity of population. Uh, women gain bargaining power as they devote less time uh, to, to child rearing and, and gain more autonomy. But also other differences emerge um, on top of gender differences uh, that, that become a kind of substitute for gender inequality as a way of, of organizing things in a hierarchical uh, fashion. Uh, but it's still true that resistance to change remains pretty strong. Um, and uh, the, just the inertial power of our history is, is pretty difficult to, to, um, to reverse. So men and employers, I think, still derive some pretty significant benefits from gender inequality that involves women's specialization in care. And women continue to bear a very disproportionate share of the costs of depending of caring for dependents. Sometimes uh, this is termed a process of social reproduction. I think the vocabulary maybe matters less than um, uh, how, we, how we conceptualize the, the process and its consequences. Okay, so now I wanna go back to strategy and think a little bit about, reflect a little bit on what, um, what the implications might be uh, for uh, uh, feminist priorities and feminist uh, mobilization. Um, I think what we're seeing as a part of conservative realignment in the US and elsewhere is an appeal to dominant national and racial ethnic interests. And this is very closely connected to a reassertion of patriarchal leadership. And I, do, I don't think it's accidental. I think that there are synergies between these uh, dimensions of collective interest that need uh, more recognition. And of course, they're promising uh, a bigger slice of the pie, but also promising a bigger pie, um, especially on the national level. And it becomes uh, a very tempting prospect uh, for people uh, to join to realign in this way when they see that it's potentially successful. So, um, you know, perceptions of, the, of, of what other people are gonna do or what other people are coalescing around uh, have this momentum of their own that I think um, leads to these kind of waves uh, of waves and reversals and advances that, 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 that we're living through. So if you look back at the history of feminism as a global movement, uh, it's been very, very successful in, in some respects. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, challenging patriarchal law and explicit discrimination against um, women on the basis of their gender, that's, that's a very significant accomplishment. But what we see is that the economic consequences of these changes have been pretty unequally distributed. So professional and managerial, women in professional and managerial jobs um, uh, have, have really moved towards, much more successfully towards gender equality uh, than others. And it's because their, their access to those jobs is conditioned by their class and race and national uh, identities. It's also true that in countries with a lot of, uh, inequality based on class and race, high wage women can pretty much displace their care responsibilities or, or minimize them, not eliminate them, but at least minimize them by hiring low wage women. And uh, we know a lot about this in, in the US what the consequences of low wage uh, immigration have been for the labor force participation of highly educated women. So persistent racial ethnic differences have also really uh, around a lot of issues have, have made women, have divided women. But it's not just women who are divided. Um, 
Low-income people are divided. Uh, whites are divided. Uh, there are divisions everywhere, and I, I don't think we should make more of the divisions among women or among, but you know, within feminism as a group, than we do um, about uh, other groups. So uh, it's pretty clear that gender identity still remains pretty strong, and one of the reasons it remains really strong is that it's not limited to what's going on in in paid work or with respect to earnings inequality, that there are issues that really have material consequences for women, like reproductive rights, sexual assault, harassment, disrespect. These are kind of cross-class, cross-race issues. And I, I think um, public health and, and a, a effective response to pandemic is another example of, of, a, of, a, of an issue that is, is really, um, uh, leading to, contributing to the growing gender gap uh, around uh, public policy because women have uh, very different opinions about public health and pandemic um, policy than men do. Uh, and uh, that's especially true in the U.S. You know, finally, the work family stress and below replacement birth rates, I think, have kind of brought an issue to the fore that um, women, uh, both women and men uh, are very, very cognizant of some changes in our economic system and demographic dynamics uh, that are, are, somewhat, um, are somewhat threatening and likely to continue to be contested. So uh, I think what this means um, for, for feminism, uh, is that women are very unlikely to make further gains unless they build broader coalitions, which I think they are in the process of doing, uh, or participating in broader coalitions. And those coalitions have to be based on, on broader principles than just ending gender inequality. Um, in the US, the phrase feminism for the 99% has been a, a really good uh, catchphrase. Um, I think, uh, there's some rethinking about what equal opportunity means, not just absence of discrimination, but it means uh, uh, proactive efforts to develop, um, offer everybody the opportunity to develop their own capabilities uh, and the capabilities of others. And it also means uh, much more attention to public goods, uh, to care as a public good, but also to climate as a public good and many other aspects of our, our social and physical uh, environment as as public goods, and I, I I guess I do see potential for a, a strong coalition to emerge uh, around these rather big issues. So I guess I will will end here just with a note that I think we are very uh, women as a group are very divided, but not quote unquote conquered, and that. Um, I think the importance of understanding the divisions of within among women is is really pretty clear and needs to be a pretty top priority. Um, but also, I want to end on a kind of positive note with a sculpture that was placed in in front of the Wall Street, uh, the Bull of Wall Street, um, a couple of years ago, uh, that I think kind of symbolizes. Uh, visualize what, what I mean by uh, the way in which changes in, um, in women's empowerment uh, be become a kind of um, become a kind of signal uh, for other challenges to hierarchical power, uh, this little figure known as the fearless girl. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much for the presentation. So to remind you, there's two ways to get on the list to ask questions. Uh, either raise your hand in the participants uh, function, or you can uh, write the question in the Q&A and I will give you the word. So either of those two options. Thank you very much. Uh, Nancy, great stuff. I haven't, I haven't read the book and I, I would certainly want to go and see it. Um, uh, just a couple of very quick questions. One is, um, you know, what is beyond uh, uh, patriarchy? 
I mean, what do you envision as the new sort of uh, uh, structure that goes beyond uh, patriarchy? And the second question that I have is, um, in effect, picking up on, on, on your last uh, um, summary um, of the division, the distinctions among women. Um, you know, I mean, is the division or the distinction uh, among groups of women an obstacle to, to go beyond uh, patriarchy according to your uh, analysis? Uh, or is it something we should build on in order to be able to go uh, into different structures, into different political economy structures. That's it, thank you. These are really great questions. Um, I wanna emphasize, I don't like the noun patriarchy. Um, I think it's, it's over simple uh, because it implies that there's a separate um, system called patriarchy that somehow exists along with capitalism um, and other things, but it's not, it's not a standalone system. I think patriarchal um, power structures have always coexisted with class uh, and kind of uh, nation-based or, or group-based hierarchies. And in fact, they've, they've built on each other in some, in some very um, significant ways. Like, I'm not sure that we would have the kind of capitalist institutions that we have today if they hadn't grown out of or been influenced by patriarchal structures. And I, but I also think capitalist institutional structures have really influenced um, uh, you know, everything that they've touched. So you, I, I like to use the adjectives rather than nouns like patriarchal power structure, capitalist power structure, race, racial ethnic power structure, nationalist power structure, because I think the, that kind of fits my visual image of, of many different uh, uh, overlapping hierarchies. And I think what that means is that um, what, what we want to move towards is not just a society where there's gender equality, but towards a society in which basically every individual uh, has more space to develop their own capabilities and those of other people. Um, and it, I think that's, it's basically a way of restating the democratic socialist vision, I think. Um, but, but insisting that more attention to gender and age and um, sexuality and race and, and national identity is really important to that, to that vision. Um, so um, I think democratic socialism itself is a concept that kind of really needs to be reconstructed in a, in a significant way. And, you know, your second question, yes, it is both, it's contradictory. The differences among us are both a strength and a weakness. Um, uh, they slow us down and make, makes it harder for us to come to agreement, but they also create opportunities from, for us to learn from each other. Uh, so uh, I guess the question is whether we, we can improve our knowledge or understanding of our own differences enough to convert them into something that is um, more positive than it, than it is, you know, than it is today. Okay, then I'll hand over the word to Susanna Grossbart. It's nice to hear you, Nancy, and uh, that was a very good talk. And I think we all respond to incentives, whether we are economists or not. And with all what's going on, you know, since COVID and Black Lives Matter and all those things, it looks like your work is moving in the direction of responding more to macro levels of institutions and, and, and you know, uh, the, the whole pie, whereas you also have a whole line of work that is about women and including women in the economics profession. As was mentioned by Johanna, you have been president of IAFI, which is one of the more activist organizations for making changes for women within the economics profession. And um, I just want to hear more about care work and your, you know, do you have any uh, more to say about 
what yeah. we can do as economists, as women economists, to promote um, more equality in our own world? Well, I think care work is a really good example of something that creates benefits for everyone, but it creates vulnerabilities for those who provide it. So that's true on the individual level. Uh, women who specialize in providing care, stay-at-home moms, um, et cetera, are doing really productive work, um, but they're doing it at great risk to themselves. They're not always penalized because there is income sharing in households and um, it's not an in inevitable source of disadvantage, but specialization in care basically is a big risk factor for women, especially care of young children, but also care of elderly family members or individuals who are, are sick or disabled. And notice that, that that same logic applies on the macro level. That is a country that invests a lot in its health and education rather than its productive capability may lose out in international competition. It may find it harder to attract international capital, et cetera. But it's still the better strategy in terms of uh, overall level of, of output broadly defined, right? So actually, I think it's really important to see a parallel between what the, the, the costs of specialization and care within families and the costs on the on the national level, and also to, to recognize that care has these public good aspects and that people who are not engaging in care are basically free riding on uh, the efforts of those who are creating this public good. So it's, it's in a way, it's a very traditional public finance argument, right? I mean, you can find it in an Econ 101 textbook, but it needs to be applied. I'm just saying, let's apply it to care work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I can hand over the word to Johanna. Yeah, so I wanted to ask a question about the mechanisms behind the decline of the patriarchal system. If I understood things correctly, the, you argued that the patriarchal institutions were raising fertility in the past, and that was very good for economic growth. But as economies have developed, that process has, like, there's not as much payoff uh, from those patriarchal institutions. So I was wondering if you could give some examples or explain a little bit more on those points. Well, look at when we, you know, really good example would be increased geographic mobility in Europe as wage labor developed, or even more, an even better example would be out migration. Uh, you know, when a, a, a younger generation in, in Sweden and England uh, and other countries, you know, came to the US, um, so, you know, really the kind of integrity of the family unit is being sundered by the economic mobility created by technological opportunities to exploit new environments. And, you know, the, the a capitalist employer has no real incentive to inve invest in his or her workers because those workers are mobile. Um, and, um, so the you know capitalism itself is, is is involves a switch from an institution where people derive some productive benefits from their reproductive investments to one in which um, you know reproduction and production were increasingly separated and therefore reproduction itself becomes more costly and you know the only way to guarantee a better life for your kids which is a big part of the motivation that patriarchal families have despite their inequalities is to uh, increase uh, their education and their skills um, rather than to have a large quantity of them, right? And that in turn sets in motion some, some you know, uh, all these shifts towards, you know, greater efficiency, economies of scale, labor mobility uh, that undermine it to the point where children are described today as kind of consumer goods. You know, you choose not, you know, you choose to have them because you, you know, they're fun, like pets, right? Um, and yes, people derive a lot of benefits from raising children, but they don't derive any economic benefits except insofar uh, as 
a welfare state taxes them to support the elderly and old age. So the welfare state itself is kind of a substitute for or a replacement. It, it's an effort to compensate for that sundering of productive and reproductive dynamics. So I, I actually have a whole chapter in the book about the really reinterpreting the welfare state in these terms. Thank you. Okay, so then we have a question from uh, Matteo Pina Pintor. If you want to ask it in person, you can unmute yourself, otherwise I'll read it out. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, thanks Nancy for this uh, nice presentation and I look forward to reading your book. Uh, in uh, listening to this presentation and also presentation in the past, it occurred to me, uh, correct me if I am wrong, that there are two sides, uh, let's say, in your analysis from the point of view of what could be uh, the design of a feminist political strategy. On the one hand, there might be efforts directed at designing new economic arrangements that value care work appropriately, let's say. So there is this idea that here there is a positive externality in a sense, which is not well accounted for capitalist economies, institutions. And on the other hand, however, there is uh, what is perceived perhaps, or at least that's my feeling, perceived to be the main uh, discussion about gender equality, which refers to enforcing uh, equal contributions, and then there are discussions about what this means, uh, irrespective of uh, the extent to which society accounts or fails to account for the social value of care work. So I wanted to ask you, uh, if you could devise a feminist political strategy, what would be the, let's say, the weight to assign to these two different, uh, these two different tasks? On the one hand, improving the ability of the economy to account for care work, and on the other hand, uh, enforcing equal contribution to care work, irrespectively of the the way society accounts or fails to account for the social value of care work. Uh, that's a really good point, and I agree that there's a lot of tension between those two um, objectives. But I think the really the essence of my argument is that they have to go together. Um, it would be very hard to persuade men to share care work more equally if it is com continues to be really under remunerated and under recognized. And um, I guess I have a somewhat uh, naive confidence that uh, if we could improve our understanding of, of care work and why it is simultaneously productive and uh, creates vulnerabilities, uh, we could encourage a process of renegotiation um, about the division of responsibility between men and women, but also between public and private, between uh, you know, people who are raising children and people who are not, uh, and so forth and so on. And um, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of political strategies under discussion right now that could, that, that could kind of fit into this um, uh, larger problematic. Um, like, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, a lot of discussion about universal basic income a lot of pros and cons, uh, a lot of concern that um, it might, on the one hand, provide some support for care work, but on the other hand, might uh, reinforce uh, traditional gender roles. And I think what that means is that advocates of UBI need to be uh, really attentive uh, to the, that threat and really need to push for a UBI for children uh, that's as large or larger than a UBI for adults and uh, to tie the, you know, in a sense, to tie the assurance of, of, uh, of basic income to the performance of, 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 of activities that benefit everyone, um, which, and I see the care of dependents as one of those, one of those activities. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks. I thought I would take the opportunity to ask a question as well myself. I was wondering a little bit how you see COVID uh, in terms of long-term issues and problems, but perhaps most importantly of opportunities um, for feminist strategy and sort of integrating care work better into the economic system. Yeah, well, I, I think that's what we're, um... I think this is what we're we're kind of living through and seeing. I mean, on first, I would say COVID has really really demonstrated our interdependence, uh, and I think the concept of a public good and a public bad, uh, the concept of externalities now is, I think, very um, you know has been illustrated in a very very powerful way. I think we've seen varying degrees of success across countries in the in the. Uh, uh, ability to cope with uh, the the pandemic, and of course, uh, we haven't kind of finished our assessment really of, of of what works, what doesn't. There's still a lot of controversy, but it's pretty clear that some healthcare and elder care delivery systems are much worse than others, and I think uh, uh, the the care delivery system in the U.S. has been revealed as very extremely dysfunctional. Um, I mean, literally not. Uh, uh, you know, life-threatening to a large percentage of the population. Um, so I think it it's highlighted the importance of the care sector as well through the importance of unpaid work. You know, unpaid work has become the the safety net, the buffer. Uh, and you know, what's interesting about unpaid work is it has a very high elasticity, but it's elasticity with respect to need not elasticity with respect to price. And, and what we see is how important it is to have that elasticity with respect to need. If we had relied entirely on price-based mechanisms to meet the challenge by the pandemic, we, our whole system would have fallen apart. So I, I think it's a real, it's kind of a vindication of, uh, of uh, the insistence that we need to have a social system that is responsive to need and not just, you know, not just to the market. Um, so, you know, I, you know, is that all going to add up to a, 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 a big political inflection point? I don't know. Um, I think we have to do whatever we think is likely to happen in the future. We should be doing our best to try to make it have that effect. Thanks. Uh, Astrid Kunze has a question. Very interesting. I, I wanted, wanted to come back to your point regarding care and uh, men and fathers. So how do you think from a political economy point of view, ma fathers, men can be more getting involved in care? So how do you view in the Scandinavian countries? So I'm, I'm uh, in Norway, where, which has introduced the paternity quota, which has led to that uh, within five years, almost all fathers took some parental leave. And we see in time use data that men are taking more care and um, relatively more time and care for younger children. Do you think these are the ways to go if you don't think that the market can regulate it also in non-European countries? Uh, yes, I'm a big fan of, of the incentives to shared parental leave in, in the Nordic countries. And I think they're a model for the rest of the world, um, I, I guess I would, I would just add that I, I think instead of focusing on specific policies like um, parental leave, we really need to look at a bigger picture that also um, acknowledges that women in paid employment are really concentrated in health and education and social services, and that these jobs are really underpaid relative to other jobs because they're producing public goods. So I think we need to recognize the parallels between unpaid care at home and underpaid care in the market. Um, and uh, that that would involve some pretty substantial uh, rethinking of pay policies and, and management policies in in the larger care, care sector. May I ask a second yeah, question following on this? Yeah. So I agree on the, what you say about the 
the care sector, health sector, that uh, also now in COVID, we see all these wage negotiations uh, in these sectors, whether they were like yeah. in Germany, they have raised now salaries of healthcare work, workers by 10%. So they have given them some credit back. But on the other hand, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, the gender wage gap is very low, despite the fact that a lot of women, like in Norway, it's 60% uh, of women are working in the public sector. On the other hand, in the US, in Germany, the gender wage gap is quite high. In a way, this doesn't co go seem to go quite together. What's your view on that? Well, a lot depends uh, on how you're defining the gender wage gap. Um, there are big differences in full-time employment versus part-time employment. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I, I think there are also big differences in the distribution of women's earnings that make comparisons across countries a little bit difficult. I mean, in the US, our earnings are so unequal. That, in fact, this is a good example of intersectionality. Um, you know, in the, in the US, the distribution of earnings is so unequal that gender equality doesn't really um, help a lot of women. I mean, what gender equality reflects is, uh, you know, a distribution of wages where some, a lot of women in the US have moved into professional managerial jobs and a lot of them remain in really low paid service jobs. So the average that you get there is very different than the average that you get in, in, in Sweden or Norway where the wage distribution is much more compressed. So um, I, I, I just think that's a good example of what I'm getting at when I say you can't really look at, at, at gender in isolation and that we just really need to move towards a more, a more holistic uh, intersectional approach. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Ulla, can you see some more questions? Mm, no, no. There's okay. No then we would like to give applause for this great talk. It's extremely interesting. I mean, obviously, we all have to buy the book. Uh, I'm definitely going to do that. So, um, yeah, thanks again so much. And I want to tell you an announcement about the next talk which unfortunately we've had to move one week forward. So Raquel Fernandez, her talk was supposed to have been on November 16th, but it is going to be on November 23rd. The same time, it's still a Monday, it's just moved one week forward. So that's also, you're gonna see that information on email as well, but I wanted to let everybody know now so that you can mark your cal calendar for Raquel's talk, which is gonna be uh, it's called Girls, Boys, and High Achievers, and it's uh, an, like an education gender paper. So uh, we hope to see you all then on the 23rd. And uh, thanks for attending today. And uh, thanks again, Nancy. Thank yeah, thank you to you all. <laughs>